Hello, I'm Carla here at Lindy Central. I'm here with my good friend, Aaron Morris. Welcome. Hi. It's good to see you. Good to see you. So uh, you're hanging out in St. Louis right now, yes? Yes, in a basement in St. Louis. But you've got some cool lighting going on there too, so. I do, I try to keep it, I try to keep it moody so that I'm <laughs> entertained. Very nice, very nice. Well, you know what, I wanted to know if you would share a little bit about your background in dance with anybody who uh, wants to hear about the Aaron Morris story here. Aw, awesome. Well, the funny thing is that most people think uh, I'm primarily some other kind of dancer, like a modern dancer or a classical dancer, but um, I'm through and through a jazz dancer. I didn't dance a step till I was 14 and I started swing dancing with my mom uh, in Ann Arbor, Michigan. And we started swing dancing and ballroom dancing. So I came into this world as a little rhythmic partner dancer. And uh, I didn't have the opportunity to take any solo dance classes until I was in college. Um, and then not until my senior year of college, actually, we weren't allowed to take any classes from the dance curriculum until you were a senior, if you were a non-dance major. So my senior year of college, I took modern and ballet and West African dance, and I just went nuts. And by the way, I was not good at any of them. Um, <laughs> but I've also, as much as I love partner dancing, and Lindy Hop is my, my first and probably longest love, um, I've been forced to dance by myself a lot, always. I haven't had a regular partner in a long time. I've rarely lived in the same city as a partner. Um, and so I've had to be very independent. And I've always desired a relationship with myself, an artistic movement relationship. And I always envied people that had um, what I would call studio dance training and classical dance training. So, I mean, I took the YouTube pathway and the, the group on class pathway, and I just tried to give myself as many fundamentals as I could so that I could, again, kind of go home to my space. And I, I always think of it as trying on clothes, you know, like you put on the leather jacket and you're like, am I badass? I don't know. Maybe it's not me. So you just, you give yourself enough of a wardrobe to really play with until you hone like your style, who you are, what makes you really feel like you, or what's maybe a little more costumey and aspirational. Not that any of those things are bad, but it's just, it's a real way of developing your sense of how you want to look when you're moving. Well, that's fascinating. So you and your mom had a chance to dance together. And does she still dance? She does not, no. She had like some shoulder surgery stuff that happened, but definitely she's the reason I became anything. She flew me to my very first Lindy Hop workshop, which was a Kevin and Carla <laughs> uh, San Francisco workshop back in like, I don't know, 2001 or something. <laughs> Wow, wow, that's amazing. Well, I had no idea, that's crazy. Well, yeah, so you, you met me and my mom when I was like 17. <laughs> crazy, yeah, I, I remember I met you in California, but I, cu I couldn't remember exactly when that was. But that, that was years later when I'd moved there, but no, yeah. Oh my gosh, that's amazing. Well, yeah, we'll have to talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> Memories. <laughs> Well, so this is so interesting to hear about kind of part of your dance journey. So I know for like a lot of people, you know, we will go to workshops with these, you know, esteemed instructors and we don't really get to know about their personal struggles that they've had with dance, their, where they get their inspiration, training even, you know, just fun adventures that they've been on. So it's just kind of this like, quick, you know, experience. So it's really nice to get to, to know you on that. So I would, I would love to know, like, do you have like favorite uh, mentors or inspiration, you know, when you're feeling like, okay, I need something to get me going or to, I'm, I'm really inspired by this person or this type of music or movement, like what's your muse? Oh my gosh. Um, I, 
I go through old, old clips and I try to find um, the stuff that hasn't been found yet, you know, which I think everybody that's doing historical excavation, we all want to find that thing and that source of steps and that source of movement that's never been seen before. Um, and, you know, YouTube is changing all the time. When I started sourcing clips on YouTube, there were like 12. And, you know, then it just starts to steamroll and all of a sudden all of these soundies and all of these sources are coming on that, you know, in uh, 10 years ago, I couldn't have ever found and used. So I, I do like to, to do a dig through. Um, I would say that of my swing dance contemporaries, um, you know, Nathan Bew has been a partner of mine and has been a, a mentor of mine and a source of inspiration. I feel like if I ever want to challenge myself in soft shoe dancing or any um, any historical step combos, I would totally, you know, ask Nathan for a private lesson and just be like, make me do that hard step <laughs> because he's just great for that kind of um, articulation and, and brain training that, uh, I'm not so good at breaking down stuff that I look at. What I, I like to take um, sort of gestural inspiration from things. I love to watch a flamenco dancer and just kind of get the, the flow of it into me, not because I'm gonna try to imitate any of the steps, but there's something about the character or the bearing or the feeling it gave me that I'm then gonna steal that little bit of sparkle and try to use that as a source for me when I'm, when I'm moving through something. So I look at a lot of different kinds of dancing and I try, I try to find something that um, strikes me, this is gonna sound really cool, Corny, but strikes me as true. There's a lot of stuff out there that's really technical or really something can be really impressive without being compelling. So I try to find compelling stuff and I try to understand what's compelling about it. And then I try to let myself walk down a similar hallway and open similar doors and, and, and look around because I mean, in terms of what I'm going to be able to achieve, I know I'm not going to have the highest technical ability or, you know, I can't do backflips and I can't lift my leg over my head. So you have to find the art that you're capable of and you still have to be moved by the art that you can do. And so I'm always, I'm always gleaning for that. That's really interesting. So that's kind of like, like a little bit about you know, where you're getting your inspiration, but it also starts to feel like I'm getting to know how you start to get your work done in your dance, right? Yeah. Would you be willing to share a little bit about that with us? Like, what is your like practice schedule like? Do you even have one? You know, I know for myself, it's like, woo, depending on, I, you know, I got a workshop coming up or I'm going to compete in this or, you know, I'm just having the feels or something lately. So yeah. yeah, it's funny right now because all of my dance gigs for the year are canceled. Um, I don't have as deep of an attachment to Lindy Hop or jazz. And for me personally, when I was growing up as a jazz dancer, I was really tied to live music and the live music experience. And it's a little it's a little staler for me to just like work on solo jazz choreo to recorded music and I can force myself to do it, but I really start to lose something or I really start to chase after a pattern that a peer of mine is creating instead of it having any connection to what I really like and what I really want. So I've been exploring much more this kind of what I refer to as this fusion kind of dancing. And it's, it's not a fusion between jazz roots and anything else. It's not like jazz and tango or jazz and ballet, but it's a fusion of jazz with any kind of movement expression articulation that is entering my realm that doesn't have to be based on history or genre. Um, it's just kind of like unbinding itself from that, but it's inescapable for me that I am a jazz dancer. Like that, that's, that's how I was born. That's my first, you know, 15 years of my life. So I try not to worry about like how jazzy it is. Like, I feel like I can start at this place where I'm like, I am a jazz dancer. <laughs> you know, I don't have to, um, I don't have to mind through that anymore. And then from there, I try to also, just move however I need to, to connect with myself and with the music. And a big part of um, 
crafting movement that's not rhythm based but is more expression based or um, melodically based is training your balance and your physical control and your lines a little bit more so i try to do something every day that's this kind of fundamental work i'll take a youtube ballet class or an instagram live class and i'll try to make sure i can plie and releve and just kind of work through my muscles and my feet so that i don't get injured when i'm trying stuff i'm old i'm going to get injured if i don't do things right <laughs> so i try to every day i try to put some put some eat and broccoli work in <laughs> where i'm just taking Taking care of stuff and then I try to find a reason to move I try to find some like sometimes I'll just sit on my computer for hours chasing music until I find something that just is poetry to me and I want to move around to it and that is to me like tied animalistically back to my like uh, creation as a dancer you know like I really just want to want to move to the music I don't want to force it and if all else fails you know I do grab my toddler and I just bring her down to dance with me and I just chase her around and I copy what she's doing because she's brilliant and she doesn't know what other people want her to look like or what she's supposed to do and so I just kind of go nuts with her until I, I feel something real happening again because that's the hardest thing is it, it, I'm never going to be a ballet dancer. I'm never going to be, um, I'm never going to be anything except me. So I can feel when I'm putting my body into places that it's not ready for, or that aren't sincere to me. And uh, I really have to find a way to avoid that and, and create unknown stuff. And that's how, like, how do you plan for that? I plan to create unknown stuff today. It's, it's, it's a challenge, but for me, it's the only challenge to strive for. Otherwise I don't. Uh, I, I'll, I'll just watch some Netflix. So, okay, this is really, it's so amazing getting to know you on this, on this level. And I'm sure, I, I bet a lot of people can relate to that feeling of thinking, I'll never be something, right? And we're talking about like the dance journey. You know, I know I've heard so many people over the years of teaching or just being in the dance community, people saying that, like, well, I'll never be as good as that person. Or, you know, I, I'll i never have, you know, flexibility or, you know, or even speaking to the age things. I, I think I'm, I think I'm older than you, Erin, but, you know, what, what really is age all about, you know, and what is it about in movement, you know, so if if we could maybe dive into that idea right now of like about like getting out of our own way in dance do you feel like that's been something that you've personally battled and then also as an instructor like when you come across you know a student that has that feeling in them you know like what what do you do to help support them in that area students are funny Students are really hard because, uh, so I'll start with that. Um, I mean, I guess I'll start with blanketly saying, yes, I struggle enormously <laughs> with that. Um, that. That's just like the therapy you have to go through, right? Is um, giving yourself permission to see yourself as a dancer and permission to see yourself as an artist instead of always calling yourself um, something else you know, regardless of your station or how long you've been doing anything. So um, a conversation I come across with certain students is that's like sometimes a really advanced student will come to me and they'll be like, I just can't consistently make finals or, you know, I keep talking to everybody and I'm like, what's your specific feedback that's going to get me to that next level? Why, why am I advanced and not an all-star? What's the, what else do I need to do? What can I, and I'm always like, how many times do you think I, ask, they say, what should I do next? What's the next thing I need to work on so I can get there? And I said, how many times do you think I asked somebody, what should I do next? And they were like, I don't know. And I said, zero. I never, I never asked anybody what to do next. Nobody was there for me. So many of us that grew up dancing a really long time ago, um, there, there was nobody to guide you through those upper echelons. You were kind of a pioneer. Um, and I think everybody deserves to treat themselves as that, even though there are like so many examples of those ladders, 
that you can follow. Like you don't have to be on the same ladder as everybody else. You need to give yourself permission to say, okay, well, this is what I care about in my dancing. This is what I want to say when I get on the dance floor, whether I'm holding somebody's hand or I'm by myself. Um, this is what I want to be about. And I think the real question is, are you having trouble finding out what you want to be about? Because that's okay. That's really hard, but that's the real work right don't don't give somebody else that power i think students give teachers way too much power nobody else should have the power to tell you what you should do next that's that's insane every time somebody says what should i do i say what do you want what do you want you know what do you prefer what do you like what are you drawn to and then i have to like hone in on their real goal and i say okay i can assist you in achieving what you want but there's i always say there's nothing i want about you or for you I don't want anything except your happiness. I don't want you to kickball change better. I don't want you to swivel better. I don't care, you know? I want you to be you and be fulfilled on the dance floor. What a perspective. Um, I, that is definitely something, you know, I've, I've wrestled with personally and also as a, as a dance instructor where someone will come over and ask those questions and, I mean, I think there was a time where, you know, reflecting back, like there, there's definitely a lot of truth in the fact that like, maybe if we started a little bit earlier than other people, we had a totally different set of tools and resources to work with. And it was kind of like, you know, with our, our kickboard changes were like our dance machetes, <laughs> like the getting the weeds out of the way and then you know and then trying to find out who you were as a dancer and editing and i can think of so many times where i i definitely said to somebody you know oh well what other classes are you taking oh you know what goals do you have you know and yeah so it's really interesting perspective you know as, as someone who i've been dancing swing dancing for a long time and i feel like every couple of years i'm like i, I i'm not feeling like i know my voice anymore in it and so it's like this uh, step back, reinvent here and that personal work. And I think, you know, you said something about to your, your student, you know, or if you were telling me if I was your student, um, you know, like, you're not, I, I, you don't want them to do it for you, right? It's, it's something deeper, you know, and, and I think that that is so powerful and so meaningful and, you know, do you think we will be as, like addressing that in your upcoming class at all? Oh, um, I mean, I hope so. I hope that that's the kind of the whole idea of the class is anytime you're giving yourself um, uncharted territory to move through, that is the thing that you're nurturing, right? Like that's, that's the, the essence that you're getting down to is um, why do any of it? why do any of it and so especially when you're working on genreless dancing or you're working on solo dancing that's outside of the competition eye or the choreography eye um you've got to be moving for something right and uh i mean like i move for validation as much as the next person moves for validation i, I it's not to say that i'm um some unique warrior <laughs> that has figured out how to do without it but um, I think you have to put in the hours and the miles and the more miles and hours you put in trying to push yourself, the more you can say, okay, these hundred hours, this looks like me trying to be something else and trying to please someone else. And these, these four hours right here, I didn't know I could do that. I didn't know that existed. That's, that's cool. That like, and, and you have to have the hundred cheesy hours, bad hours, falling down hours, like looking stiff, blah, like you just have to try and produce and produce and produce. You have to be there. You, you know, you have to be at the easel when the muse comes. Like you just have to put the, the work in to get down to those little kernels and nuggets. And the more you see the little kernels, the more you can edit yourself and the more decisions you can make that become more about your style and your viewpoint. But yeah, it's just a mess for a while, <laughs> but you have to, you, you got to start somewhere. And so like, I just want to take people's hands and say, let's start. Like, 
I don't know where you're going to go, but like you have to start and, and hopefully, hopefully you have enough fun and you get enough endorphins and sweat out of it that at the end of it, you're like, oh, well, if I can't like concretely say what I just accomplished, but my body, you know, has a reward response to what we just went through, then hopefully it's going to link you to doing it again. And then it becomes daily. And then before you know it, you're having fun and you've got those hundred hours in. And that means you found four of those hours that were freaking you and amazing. Yeah, you know, like so many things, like pretty much anything you want to be excelling at, you know, you do have to put the hard work in and that can come in a lot of different forms, I think, for different individuals, right? So I think you just said a bunch of things in there of like what dance does for people, this like release of endorphins, the sweat, the exercise, the connection, hopefully to yourself, maybe even a part of yourself that you didn't even know was there. Um, and I think that's really identifiable for like a lot of people. And over the, over the years, I've heard, you know, people express things about like getting to know themselves better through dance. You know, you, you start to be able to, you mentioned editing, right? You start to edit, you know, your taste in movement and in, in, in design and, and maybe in music and what you're filling your days with. And that's so, I think that's so powerful for people. And I think it's, it's great that we get to hear, you know, from you and, and your personal journey with that and, and just kind of unravel this upcoming class with you as, as well, you know, and, and actually I have another question for you as someone who's seen you dance, you know, for a number of years and, and actually getting ready to have this class with you. Um, I can't remember the name of the group that you danced for. Um, and maybe you still do the orchestra, um, that you did a bunch of like chorus girl work and solo work. Oh, the, the ragtime orchestra, the river raisin ragtime or was it James DePogny's projects, the Phil Ogilvy Rhythm Kings? Yeah. I yeah. came across a bunch of those videos, which, you know, sent me down to a rabbit hole. <laughs> Speaking of you, oh. and I was like, this is amazing. You have quite the body of work under you, Erin. Oh my gosh. And just so much like variety out there. And all these performances I'm watching and I'm like, there's Erin. You just put yourself out there. And I just felt like this, there's, so much authenticity there and yet over the years you can see how things have changed too you know s different skills and diff different ideas and different you know formations and as someone who's creating so much when you put your own personal piece out there like let's say for ILAT or something you're putting together a routine with someone how do you go back and you look at it like in an editing eye like is this you know for ILHC is this for jazz? What is this for? Or do you just keep it like, this is for me. This is me giving this piece right now. Like, how do you think about that? Because I, that's an amazing question. Like NPR level. <laughs> um, I'm always, there is like a thing that I'm chasing in my heart, which is that I think that the, music video genre is just amazing. And I know that I have seen some things in my life. Hold on, Piper. Sorry. <laughs> I have seen some things in my life that just make me feel like my heart was ripped out of my chest and then like fed back through my mouth. Like I've just been so moved by this genre. And when I look through the Aaron Morris YouTube rabbit hole, I'm just like, oh God, like it horrifies me for one, because it's hard for you to be kind to your past selves. Right. And I'm always like, I hope nobody ever is going down the Aaron Morris rabbit hole. But I, so like this thing happens where I meet someone new and they're like, oh, you're a dancer. What's that like? And I'm like, oh, I want to send them a video of me dancing so they understand who I am. And guess what? That video doesn't exist. There is no video of me dancing that currently exists that I can say, that's who I am. That's how I dance. And so every time I'm putting together a project, I'm trying to make that video. And it can be difficult if it's limited, like if it's a ragtime orchestra that's like, oh, your music is set in 1917. And I'm like, oh, how do I, <laughs> like, 
how do I really put me into this? Um, but especially for opportunities with ILHC, um, like that last year team with Ryan Calloway, I did such sweet thunder. Um, very inspired by Sid Charisse and, and, and things like that, that were just really giving me the good feels at the time. But I, I'm looking to put something out there that I'm like, this is a really well-rounded look of how I approach music and myself and, and connection. And so far it's impossible, but it, you know, that's the, I think you need to have impossible aspirations. I, I think that's important that it's always just like, it keeps, it drives me crazy, but like, I'm still here. I'm not getting burned out because I haven't, I haven't met like any of my goals. <laughs> so I'm still, I'm still going. I think that goes back to what we talked about before was that, you know, artists were like a, a work in progress all, always. Right. And something, you know, we'll, you know, you'll be sharing with us in, in the upcoming class, the dance fusion class. Yeah. So that's yeah. Exciting. Yeah. I, I hope that this class is about permission, everybody giving themselves permission to dance in new ways that maybe they were holding themselves back from because they thought they couldn't or they thought they shouldn't. And I hope that the class also is, um, it, it should deliver some new tools to the toolkit for movement. And, um, and, and I think that that's the, the best thing we can do for our students is just give them some tools, give them some permission and let them figure it out. If it's meant to be, they will do the work and they will figure it out. It's, I don't think it's worth it if you, if you are looking to mold someone more severely than that. I don't, I don't think it's the right thing, personally. Do together is we're going to stretch. We're going to warm up our bodies. We're going to listen to some jazz. We're going to listen to some contemporary music. We are going to be given improvisation prompts that give us reasons to move through space and connect to the music and connect to our environment. And we're going to figure out how to feel okay about putting new or unconventional movement back into your jazz and how to feel okay with digging out of your jazz roots and putting it into um, uncharted territory, whether it's your favorite song that's on the radio and you're like, oh, you don't have to do Charleston to your favorite song. You can, you can have other dance movement tools to move to any music all the time once you have some ideas about aesthetic and your rhythm and your balance and your control and all that, so. It sounds like a great adventure is waiting for us. I'm super, I'm, I'm just so thrilled that, you know, you're willing to, to put yourself out there because I know this, this is kind of a new class for you, right? So not just for people participating, but also for you. And how yeah. do you feel about that? It's, it's hot off the presses, man. I have no idea. It's just, it's, um, it's about sharing what I've been thinking about and what I've been moving like and inviting you to ask yourself some of the same questions. And, um, you know, I think in particular, uh, just to, to center around blackness a little bit, we're all doing a black dance together. And um, if, if jazz was our first dance, that means our first gift and our first steps was black dance and black dance aesthetic. And um, I'm particularly, I, I've always been an ambassador of that and I've always been a guest in that space. Um, but the thing that I'm working through right now is also moving into blank space because I want to belong there as well. And I want to be able to um, give something back to jazz or bring jazz with me in a way that's respectful, but moves it into new territory without arguing with, with historical narratives. So um, that's, that's part of why it's been particularly important to me to work through this material. 